Over the last 12 months, Saudi Arabia has invested billions of dollars in football. That has included more than $1 billion on transfer fees, over $200 million a year salaries each for Cristiano Ronaldo, Karim Benzema and Neymar, making them the three highest paid players in the world, and a not insignificant amount spent on whining and dining FIFA representatives, in anticipation of hosting the 2034 World Cup unopposed. There is nothing new, though, about Saudi Arabia's investments in football. In 2016, China unveiled a detailed and ambitious plan to become a world football superpower by 2050, by which stage, Chinese President Xi Jinping wanted China to have both hosted and won the World Cup. It involved enormous state investments in coaching, infrastructure and pitches, massive overseas private investment in football club ownership, sponsorships and strategic partnerships, and, most eye-catchingly of all, a raft of big-name arrivals to the previously inconspicuous Chinese Super League involving staggering fees and wages. Over the next four years, China hired 13 top foreign coaches to manage soccer schools with millions of children, built a raft of 50,000-seater-plus stadiums, many of which are now empty, and over 26,000 pitches. Chinese businesses and billionaires, heavily incentivized by the state, bought up major European clubs like Inter Milan, AC Milan, Aston Villa, Southampton, Slavia Prague and Parma, along with minority stakes in Manchester City and Atletico Madrid. Of those eight clubs, only one, Inter Milan, is still majority Chinese owned and they are owned by debt-stricken Sooning Holding, who have been in a state of perpetual crisis and trying to offload Inter since 2021. As for the Chinese Super League, the likes of Carlos Tevez, Ezequiel Avetsi, Hulk, Paulinho, Alex Teixeira, Jackson Martinez, and managers like Rafa Benitez, Andre Villas-Boas, and Fabio Capello have all come and gone. China's football experiment, which was unprecedented in scale, investment, and ambition, lasted for all of four years. By 2020, the big-name signings hadn't just stopped, strict spending limits were imposed on clubs, leading to a mass exodus of high-profile foreigners, Chinese investors were encouraged to sell their overseas clubs, and actually prohibited from acquiring new ones, and a financial crisis implicating some of the country's largest companies sent the Chinese Super League into a death spiral. It's not just the players themselves that are long gone, though. Hebei China Fortune, once the club of Manuel Pellegrini, Ezequiel Avetsi and Javier Mascherano, Tanjang Quanjin, who once employed Axel Witzel, Alexander Pato and Fabio Capello, and Zhang Su Suning, also owned by Suning Holding, who once brought Brazilian trio Joe Ramirez and Alex Teixeira to China in a single transfer window, are three of a number of clubs who no longer even exist. Jiang Su having been dissolved just months after winning the Chinese Super League title, meanwhile eight-time champions Guangzhou Evergrande have been relegated to China League One, the nation's second tier. Through all of this chaos and collapse, though, there has been one constant. No, not Xi Jinping, China's president for life. I mean, technically speaking, you're right, of course, but I'm referring to former Brazilian international Oscar, who was one of the Chinese Super League's biggest coups back in December 2016, when he was signed by Shanghai SIPG for more than £50 million from Chelsea. At the time, Oscar was just 25 years old. He had already won 48 caps for Brazil, made over 200 appearances in four and a half years at Chelsea, winning the League Cup, the Europa League, and the Premier League, and he was sought after by the likes of Atletico Madrid, Juventus, and both Inter and AC Milan. Over seven years on, while everything else has crumbled around him, with his friends and compatriots, like Hulk and Paulinho having long since departed, Oscar remains like some kind of Japanese holdout soldier who believes, not that World War II, but rather, that the battle for the Chinese Super League to become a serious league filled with superstars is still ongoing. But why? Well, having recently been asked that exact question, that's what today's video is all about. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Shanghai, the third largest city in the world, as we take a look at why Oscar is the last man in China, how to reflect upon his controversial career decisions, and what it tells us about other players who have recently headed to a different part of Asia with similar motivations.
It's easy to forget, but when Oscar moved to China, he was scorned much more heavily by the European press, fans, and coaches alike than the current raft of players who have signed mega contracts in previously obscure and still significantly subpar leagues in terms of the standard of football. It was only when researching this video and reading some of the stories from that time that I remembered quite how much vitriol there was. The Chelsea manager, Antonio Conte, despite having dropped Oscar that season and significantly reduced his minutes, and in spite of the fact that Chelsea received what was a gargantuan fee for him at the time, appeared to lambast the Brazilian for his decision. When asked about Oscar in a press conference, Conte stated, Before the money must be the passion. The passion for football. We started to play when we were children without money, only passion. Then came money, but the passion is more important than money for me. If you have not got that passion, it is no good. That was his own former boss. Sky Sports pundit Jamie Carragher had even less incentive to temper his language, describing Oscar's decision as embarrassing. Writing in his column, Carragher stated, quote, it is a sad day for football when a player about to enter his prime moves for financial reasons and nothing else. The money is astronomical, but it's not as though he's earning a pittance at Chelsea. This is not a move to further his career. He'll talk about the league growing in China, the chance to work with Andre Villas-Boas, and the excitement about a new adventure, but we all know those words will be nonsense. He has gone for the size of the contract, nothing else. Players used to look for a payday in their mid-30s when their career was coming to an end. We all understood that. With the riches now on offer in China, I could understand a player's head getting turned when he reaches 30. But 25? It's embarrassing that a player would give up his career and the chance to compete for the biggest prizes in the game just for money. End quote. You will note, I think, that both in tone and in language, that the response of Conte and Carragher, which were far from isolated examples, those were just two that I happened to pick out, were much harsher than the tenor with which we talk about players who have moved to Saudi Arabia. As in the case of China, or previously Qatar and the United States, it has tended to be older players who have made the move desert side. Neymar, Karim Benzema, Angolo Kante and Riyad Mahrez, the league's highest earners, are all the so-called wrong side of 30. Meanwhile, Cristiano Ronaldo is rapidly approaching 40. The closest parallel with Oscar in Saudi Arabia is probably Ruben Neves, who, aged 26, left Wolverhampton Wanderers to join Al-Hilal La Saba, despite it being reported that there had been long-standing interest in him from a couple of European giants. There were one or two murmurs of discontent at Nevers' decision, perhaps. The odd groan of, oh, that's a shame. But I don't recall any pundits with a national profile for a major broadcaster calling it embarrassing, Julian Lopetegui accusing him of lacking passion, or a collective cry of greed, greed, greed that reverberated around the continent, as was the case with Oscar. Even Jordan Henderson, who is probably the player who has received the most criticism for his short-lived stint in Saudi Arabia, at least here in England, those complaints didn't primarily centre around football-related grievances, the implications for his career, or accusations of greed. It stemmed, primarily, from the fact that Henderson had portrayed himself as someone with a genuine interest in LGBT rights and representation in football, and then moved to a country and began doing propaganda for a regime that criminalises and, in some cases, executes LGBT people, let alone welcoming them in football. And even then, Henderson still had his defenders. People who would make the case that they too would be willing to sacrifice even deeply held beliefs if the price was right. Which, you know, does perhaps beg the question of just how deeply held those beliefs are. The tide really began to shift with Henderson though, and he seemingly lost all sympathy and support when he gave an interview to The Athletic, claiming that he moved to Saudi Arabia to spread football around the world and to be part of a project, a project, seemingly which, involved playing in front of only a few hundred fans at times, rather than due to obscene wages. Contrary to Carragher's claims at the time, though Oscar did allude to finding China's investments in football intriguing, unlike Henderson, he was actually remarkably candid and honest about the reason for his move, both when it happened and throughout his time in Shanghai. Oscar stated bluntly, speaking to Copper 90 in 2017, quote, Every football player, or every person who works, wants to earn money for their families. 
I came from a social background in Brazil that is very poor. We didn't have anything. This is the fruit of my work, and when I earn this, it is because I conquered it. End quote. There is, of course, a debate to be had about how much money someone really needs to help their families and to give them a financial security that they once lacked, and whether one or two hundred thousand pounds a week while playing for one of Europe's biggest clubs wouldn't cut the mustard, in addition to fulfilling any career ambitions, rather than the four hundred thousand pounds a week in China, and I guess that is something that we might touch on shortly, but one could hardly accuse Oscar of obfuscation or deceit. It should also be said that, unlike with someone like Steven Gerrard, who has also gone down the route of reeling off rehearsed lines as to why he is relocated, not even to Saudi Arabia in fact, but to Bahrain apparently, and commutes to the city of Daman where Al Atifak are based, Oscar wasn't a free agent in December 2016. He was tied down on a contract at Chelsea. Unhappy with his lack of game time under Antonio Conte, having been one of the first names on the team sheet at Stamford Bridge for almost half a decade by that stage, Oscar wanted to leave, but he could only go somewhere if Chelsea accepted a bid. Atletico Madrid, Juventus, Inter and AC Milan may all have been interested, in fact it is pretty clear that they were, but Chelsea were demanding upwards of £50 million. Don't forget, this is in the pre-Neymar to PSG era. Only two players in world football transferred for that much money in the 2016-17 season. One was Paul Pogba to Manchester United for a world record-breaking fee, and the other one was Gonzalo Higuain to Juventus, who were able to use the money that they received from Pogba's sale to sign the prolific Argentine from Napoli. After those two, Oscar was the third most expensive player on the planet that season, and the seventh most expensive footballer of all time, joining Shanghai SIPG for 60 million euros, or roughly 52 to 53 million pounds. It is sometimes overestimated, and this is relevant both to Oscar's move to China and the fact that he has been there quite so long, the degree to which footballers have control over their own lives. Of course, Everyone has control over their own lives. Well, I mean, you could argue that no one does if you don't believe in free will, but I'll try to steer clear of philosophical quandaries for the time being. But basically, I don't want to infantilize footballers or absolve them of responsibility over their own decisions. Nonetheless, it is just straightforwardly true that footballers, like a lot of athletes, delegate a lot of their life decisions to other people. Footballers can turn professional and earn lucrative sums of money at a very young age, at which point they might be very dependent upon their parents for guidance and advice. It's not long before agents come into the picture, at which point everything changes, at least depending upon the relationship between the player and the agent. Using Oscar as the obvious case in point, he was the typical case of Brazilian favela to fame and stardom at a very early age. Oscar was just three years old when his father died in a road traffic accident, with his mother pregnant with Oscar's soon-to-be sister at the time. Without his father, Oscar's mother sought to sustain the family by selling clothes in the streets of Sao Paulo, which provided as meagre an existence as one would imagine. Oscar's ability with the ball at his feet then was his family's ticket out of poverty. Unluckily, he had it in spades. At the age of 13, he signed for Sao Paulo, and four years later, at 17, he made his debut in the first team. Oscar was still only 18 when he had his first contract dispute, and his agent advised him to seek a move elsewhere. Oscar's representatives claimed that Sao Paulo hadn't paid salaries as promised, and that Oscar's contract was therefore null and void. Advising the teenager that he was free to leave, Oscar joined Brasileiro rivals Internacional, prompting Sao Paulo to lodge an appeal, claiming that they still owned his playing rights, and that he ought not to be able to play for Internacional. That dispute was eventually settled, with Internacional paying Sao Paulo 6 million euros to make the problem go away. But it was just a glimpse of what was to come for Oscar, and a reality for a lot of footballers. Oscar made his senior debut for Brazil five days after turning 20, and he was still only 20 when he moved to Europe, joining Chelsea for between 20 to 25 million pounds. He has spoken, since his move to China, about the fact that, as with a lot of players, he isn't even typically aware of whether a club is interested in him. Oscar's agent, Giuliano Bertolucci, whose other clients include the likes of Bruno Guimaraes, Gabriel Magalhães, and Matthias Cunha, 
filters out interest in Oscar before communicating any offers with him. This sounds nefarious and predatory, and of course it can be, but when speaking candidly about his own relationship with Bertolucci, Oscar was keen to emphasise that it is because he knows his agent so well, and their relationship is so good, that he trusts him to make those kinds of decisions. That is just one form of delegation though. It's also underestimated the extent to which some players, particularly those from countries and cultures where extended families are much closer than is typically the case in Western Europe, aren't just supporting a wife and children, but grandparents, cousins, and distant in-laws. And that's just family members. Many such players also have either entourages who often travel around with them, or friends they are supporting back home. Before long, and again, I don't want to create a stereotype or paint with too broad of a brush because this isn't the case with, say, every player from Africa or South America, but in some instances, they can end up almost supporting entire communities off the back of their astronomical salaries. We know that around 40% of footballers go bankrupt within a few years of retiring from the sport, or at least we should all know that because I've made a video about it. It's sometimes asked how one person can possibly burn through quite so much money in such a short period of time. The reality, however, is that it often isn't just one person burning through that money. It can be several or even tens of people, and it isn't necessarily over a short period of time. It's likely been happening throughout a player's career. Bankruptcy just arrives once the income dries up in retirement. I should stress, none of this is specific to Oscar. There is, as far as I'm aware, absolutely no suggestion that he or anyone else has squandered the enormous riches that he has acquired in China. It's just to provide some additional context as to the multifaceted realities within which many footballers exist. I remember when Radamel Falcao joined Monaco in 2013, at a time in which he was probably the most highly rated and sought after centre forward in the world, a lot of people were asking why he hadn't signed for Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich or Manchester United. It was an incredible signing for Monaco, who had just won promotion from Ligue 2, but it seemed like a bizarre move for Falcao, who surely had the pick of every super club in Europe. Was it all just about cash? Well, yes and no. Falcao, like a lot of South American players, particularly at that time, was under third-party ownership. He had little control over his next destination in truth, other than having to sign the contract to sanction it, and nor did Atletico Madrid. English clubs were reportedly hesitant to deal with third parties, following West Ham's Tevez and Mascherano debacle that saw them sued by Sheffield United. Meanwhile, Real Madrid were reportedly unwilling to stump up the 60 million euro fee. The only club, as you've probably guessed by now, that was willing to pay the 60 million euros to sign Falcao, pay him 10 million euros a season after tax, and deal with third parties was Monaco. The idea, therefore, that Falcao had the pick of every team on the continent and still chose to sign for little old Monaco, a newly promoted league and team with hardly any fans, was based on a misconception, as are so many grievances when it comes to transfers. Another interesting thing that you note when you chart Oscar's journey in China, and all of the various interviews that he has made over the last seven years, is his desire throughout that time to one day return to Europe. And usually, following such a big move, and as what was really a marquee signing for the Chinese Super League, Oscar was again very candid about that intention, even when he first signed for Shanghai SIPG. In that same interview with Copper 90 from 2017, Oscar stated, quote, I hope that in two or three years' time, or when my contract here ends and I've helped the team to win titles, I could go back to a big team in Europe, because what I like most is to play at a high level. Adding, when I made the decision to come here, I was thinking more of my family than of my career. I had other very good offers from big teams in Europe, but I thought a little more of my family and, after that, I am still young. I can return. End quote. Oscar's aspirations to return to Europe, to play at the highest level, and to get back in the Brazil squad have never wavered, and he has reiterated it on an almost annual basis, whether that be talking to European, Chinese, or South American media. His snubbing from Brazil's national team since moving to China, in particular, seems to hurt. 
Oscar was one of the first names on the team sheet for Brazil in his early to mid-20s. In 2013 and 14, he made 32 appearances for the Salasau, famously scoring the consolation goal, to end all consolation goals, in Brazil's 7-1 humiliation to Germany on home soil in the 2014 World Cup semi-final. You might say Oscar was naive to think that he could retain his spot in the Brazil squad while playing in Shanghai, and increasingly, he would appear to agree, but he had good reason to think that he would still be considered at the time. Following years as a stalwart, Oscar missed the 2015 Copper America with a thigh injury, but Diego Tardelli, who was 30 years old and had only ever won nine caps of Brazil, was named in Dunga's squad, despite having spent the last six months starring for Shandong Luneng in China. At the 2016 Copper America, Oscar missed out due to poor form following a dreadful title defence in which Chelsea finished 10th and everyone struggled in their squad, but again, Shandong Luneng centre-back Hill and Beijing Guam midfielder Renato Augusto still made the cut. Dunga was replaced as Brazil coach by Chiche in 2016 though, and though he continued to call up, and indeed, play Renato Augusto, who went to the 2018 World Cup, that was thought to be because Chiche knew him in and out, having had him for two and a half years, in Brazil with Corinthians. Oscar had no such relationship with Brazil's new head coach, and playing in China, he failed to catch his eye. It is a reality that has gradually dawned on Oscar, whose responses, when asked about a potential return to the national team, have gone from being impassioned and determined to almost sad, melancholic, and despondent. He hasn't given up on returning to the Brazil team, the Salasau, have a long and storied track record of recalling players following years in the wilderness and in the autumn of their careers, but he appears to be resigned to the fact that it won't happen while he is in China. The fact that Brazil have called up five players who now play in Saudi Arabia over the last 12 months alone, including their star man and his old teammate Neymar, isn't lost on Oscar, who feels as though he has perhaps been unfairly singled out for his move to a league with an inferior standard of football. That has likely been one of the big motivating factors in Oscar's repeated attempts to leave China, rarely on a permanent basis but temporarily, to try and prove to Brazil, the rest of the world, and perhaps even to himself, that he can still compete and star at the highest level. None of these attempts, though, have proven to be successful. The most high profile, perhaps, came not all that long ago, in January 2022, when Barcelona expressed an interest in signing him. Oscar didn't exactly play hard to get, telling TNT Sports, quote, It'd be an incredible opportunity for me. For Barcelona too. I'm in great form here. It would be great for my career. End quote. The club of Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, Romario, and Rivaldo, Barcelona holds a special place in the heart of many Brazilians, and for Oscar it was a dream move. He was so determined to make it happen at a time in which Barcelona were having bitter difficulties even just registering players due to ongoing financial difficulties, Oscar was willing to take a huge pay cut and perhaps even briefly vacate his pay in order to play for the club. But alas, it wasn't to be. A combination of Barca's internal shenanigans and reluctance on the part of Shanghai soon put pay to that prospect. Likewise, in the summer of 2022, when Brazilian giants Flamengo came calling, again, only looking to take Oscar on loan during the Chinese Super League's off-season, the man himself was head over heels. Oscar had been given special dispensation by Shanghai Ports, formerly Shanghai SIPG, during the COVID-19 pandemic, while football in China had been suspended and a strict lockdown implemented, to return to Brazil. He flew to Brazil again following Flamengo's interest, which progressed to such a stage that Fabrizio Romano tweeted that it was a done deal, and Oscar even uploaded a photo of himself posing in the Flamengo shirt. Though Shanghai had given a verbal agreement for Oscar to join Flamengo, nothing had been signed and at the last second, they pulled the plug. According to sources close to Oscar, who know him well, Shanghai changed their minds at the final minute because they feared that if Oscar returned to Brazil, even only on a short-term basis, got a taste for playing at a better level of football in front of Brazilian crowds again, he might not want to return to China and see out the remainder of his contract. 
Every time that a move has fallen through, Oscar hasn't disguised his frustration, but nor has he thrown his toys out of the pram or appeared to be at war with Shanghai. Amidst links with Barcelona in 2022, Oscar stated, I suppose Barca would also appreciate it, as I'm now more experienced, mature, and I know they have a lot of youngsters right now. It could work out for everybody. I'd be happy if things work out, but I still have a contract. Shanghai helps me a lot, so I have no complaints. End quote. It's the type of comment that Oscar makes a lot, praising or at least acknowledging Shanghai and careful not to appear to be disrespectful towards the club that has made him, for seven years now, consistently one of the highest paid footballers on the planet. If you ask some, it's evidence that Oscar is practically in a hostage situation. Barney Rone wrote a column in The Guardian in July, which was titled, Oscar's Chinese Purgatory offers players cautionary tale in Saudi boom era, which made the case that Oscar is effectively stuck in China. That's true, in a certain sense of course, he is under contract at Shanghai Port, and as his previous attempts to go out on loan illustrate, he cannot go anywhere else without their permission. That's not to say that he is there against his will though. To all intents and purposes, and though not without caveats, Oscar appears to genuinely enjoy life in Shanghai. Unlike a lot of players who went to China and treated it like a holiday, or at least solely as a short-term revenue-generating activity, leaving their families back home and regularly commuting between their temporary homes and wherever they're from, Oscar and his family made Shanghai their new home. Oscar is married to his childhood sweetheart, Ludmilla, who is Brazilian-Japanese, and they have spent the last seven years living together in Asia, compared to the four and a half years that they spent together in Europe. It's not unimaginable then, in fact, it would seem quite probable, that to them, Shanghai feels like home, more so than anywhere in Europe and perhaps even in Brazil at this stage, which Oscar left behind as a 20-year-old boy. Of course, if Ludmilla still has family in Japan, Shanghai is also less than a three-hour flight from the Japanese capital, compared to 14 hours from London and more than 24 hours from Sao Paulo. Their son was one year old when they moved to Shanghai, it is the only home that he's ever known, and their daughter was born there. Whereas Carlos Tevez never saw anywhere in Shanghai other than the inside of the Hongkou Stadium, which has since been badly burnt in a fire, and Disneyland Shanghai, so much so that he was actually nicknamed Disney by unimpressed Chinese supporters, Oscar's children speak fluent Mandarin, as does his wife, and Oscar says that he speaks enough to muddle by, preferring to speak English, and having his eight-year-old son translate for him whenever he gets stuck. Without wanting to engage in Chinese or CCP propaganda, that is the job of the 50 Cent Army Online, Shanghai, as Oscar has reiterated numerous times, is a very livable city, especially when you earn over 20 million pounds a year after tax in a city with an average income of less than 20,000 pounds. In terms of the football also, Oscar may miss playing for big clubs and tasting the big occasions, but it's clear that he enjoys certain aspects of playing in China in their own way. It must be said, the standard in China is bad. I suspect that less than 5% of people watching this video will probably have watched a Chinese Super League game or even highlights in the last few years, but let me assure you, it's not good. There is a reason why China, a nation of 1.4 billion people, just got knocked out of the AFC Asian Cup group stage without scoring a single goal. By 2030, it's worth noting, President Xi and the CCP's aim was for China to already be an Asian powerhouse on par with South Korea and Japan. That's just six years away now. Their men's team is currently ranked 79th in the world on par with Luxembourg, Zambia and Jordan. Unlike a lot of players who went to China though, and grew frustrated with the standard of football and the fact that they were so much better than their teammates, Oscar, while not immune to the occasional bout of irritation, has embraced it for what it is. According to coaches, he enjoys setting the standard in training as a Premier League winner and former Brazilian international, showing his teammates what it takes to become a top professional. Last season, Oscar led the Chinese Super League's assist charts for the fifth time in seven seasons, as Shanghai Ports won their second Super League title since his arrival, and their first since 2018. 
Oscar captain the club to that crown, and will captain them again next season, which gets started in March, and he seems to relish being a big fish in a small pond, and the attention that it brings the rest of the team. Also, unlike a lot of Chinese clubs, there has been practically no tension at Shanghai Port between Oscar and the rest of the team, despite the enormous disparity between his salary and everyone else's. One of the key reasons why Oscar went to China, and is still in China, is simply timing. He joined Shanghai Port, then Shanghai SIPG, at the peak of Chinese investments in football, hence his 60 million euro transfer fee, and a pay packet that reportedly quadrupled the not insignificant salary that he already earns at Chelsea. Oscar subsequently signed an extension which is, in itself I would argue, somewhat evidence that he was at least relatively content in Shanghai at the time, penning a new four-year deal in December 2019. Within months, on the orders of Xi and the CCP, and aided by a crisis in the property sector that exposed several private companies as being dangerously leveraged, most notably the Evergrande Group, China began to strip back investments in football, both at home and abroad, as I have covered in far greater detail in two previous videos, should any of you be interested in the specifics relating to that decision and its consequences. The following season, the league introduced both a cap on overseas players and on salaries, mandating that no overseas players could be paid more than 3 million euros a year. A hefty sum, no doubt, working out at around £50,000 a week, but some way shy of the astronomical contracts that the likes of Oscar and Hulk had previously signed. Oscar basically snuck in with his contract extension just before China scaled back investments in football with a record-breaking four-year deal which sees him earn somewhere in the region of £400,000 a week or £20 million a year. In 2020, Forbes estimated that Oscar was the 10th highest paid footballer on the planet, even when taking endorsements and image rights deals into account, sandwiched between Robert Lewandowski and David De Gea. After tax, others estimated that he may even have been in the top five, somewhere between Kylian Mbappe and Mohamed Salah. It would be foolish to pretend that Oscar's continued sky-high salary, just as it was in December 2016, isn't still a major reason why he's in China, but he is estimated to have earned more than £140 million in wages since then. If he hated it, he could, and would, almost certainly have left, and left as an incredibly wealthy man. You might have thought that Oscar earning several times as much as the rest of the Shanghai Port squad combined, including their only confirmed overseas player for 2024, Matthias Vargas, could cause some resentment, as it did at several other teams. At Shanghai, however, there is said to be an understanding and appreciation that Oscar is that much better than everyone else, that their salaries cannot be compared. And overall, his presence in the team benefits everyone. Though the lack of pressure on Oscar in China is a negative in some respects, it can also be perceived as a positive. Not only is Oscar able to live a very easy life, both personally and professionally, he doesn't have to worry about enraged ultras battering down his front door following a defeat. Speaking recently about the experiences of his friends and former teammates Willian and Renato Augusto, who faced threats and intimidation from Corinthians fans after returning to Brazil in 2021, prompting Willian to actually return to England with Fulham, Oscar has admitted to having reservations about joining a Brazilian team. Speaking to our score last month, he stated, quote, Playing in the country has its good side, but also has its downside. Every team faces pressure, that's normal. But in Brazil, it's going a bit too far. Some supporters threaten families, and that makes us think carefully about the decision to be made. Not only mine, but all players who are abroad. This security aspect is a bit more difficult for those of us who already have a stable life outside of Brazil to make a decision. There is the upside of affection when you're winning, but if you have a bad game, the negative pressure is enormous. I closely followed Willian's case. I see what Renato and others go through at Corinthians, and they are not in a good phase. The pressure is enormous. It's difficult to know what will happen. There is the negative side and the positive side. The positive side has cases like Hulk and others who came from abroad and were spectacular. End quote. It might have been forgotten after seven years, 
Heck, if you're watching this and under the age of 15 or 16, you'll probably barely remember Oscar, but he was a brilliant footballer. I always likened him to a poor man's or a B-Tech caca, and I mean no disrespect to B-Techs there, just to be clear. I'm only using it as a commonly understood term, insofar as Oscar was fast, athletic, he had neat and tidy feet, and he could both score and create goals. As impressive off the ball as he was on it, which is why Jose Mourinho loved him so much at Chelsea and played him ahead of prime Juan Mata, I can't help but think that Oscar would have been even better suited to English and European football the way it has adapted since he departed for China. You think of his profile, combining incredible work rate, a high intensity press, and astute technical and creative abilities, and you imagine him fitting seamlessly into, say, a Jurgen Klopp midfield at Liverpool, among others. There is a sadness there then, no doubt, both on the part of Oscar and of football fans. But the situation is not black and white. It is possible for Oscar to be very personally and, to a certain extent, even professionally content in China, with a settled family living an amazing life and earning unimaginable sums, even in a league that wasn't that strong to begin with, has since fallen apart, and where no one else earns even a small fraction of what he does, all while being tinged with a persistent, if not constant, nagging feeling of what might have been, what he could have achieved, and, most notably, what he might have been able to do with the national team, who haven't been resplendent in outstanding number eights, which is what Oscar has become in China, over the last seven years. Oscar has 11 months left on his contract at Shanghai Port, and will, it seems likely, stick around for the 2024 season. It seems equally unlikely that Oscar will stick around beyond that point though, settled or content as he and his family may be, given that he would, at best, be forced to take an 87.5% pay cut and will by that stage have spent 8 years in China. By then, Oscar will be 33 years old. A return to the national team seems unlikely, if not impossible. The level of European teams likely to be interested in him, unlike in 2022, is likely to fall some way below Barcelona. Whether that proves to be as tempting, or Oscar Banks on having a return to Brazil more akin to Hulk's than Willian's, the former of whom has been electric, even age 37, since joining Atletico Mineiro, remains to be seen. Wherever he ends up, Oscar's eventual departure will feel like a very belated bookend for a bizarre era of Chinese football, of which Oscar is virtually the last remaining morsel of the fact that it ever even happened. A cautionary tale for states and leagues with equal ambition, with billions having been spent, what has actually been gained. Chinese football is effectively back where it was 12 or 13 years ago, with a spluttering of relatively well-paid foreigners propping up the top flight, teams with funding crises and routine collapses, and the national team stuck in the doldrums. Still, at least Tevez had a good time at Disneyland. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course, goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Bot's Armour, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so, and all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.